Okay, good morning. We have Caleb Morse here with Making Sense of Latin Plant Names. Caleb received his master's degree in plant systematics from the University of Kansas in 1998 and has worked as the collection manager of the R.L. McGregor Herbarium at KU since then. His responsibilities include identification of plant and lichen specimens sent to the herbarium and collection, identification, and curation of plant and lichen specimens in support of ongoing research into the flora of the Great Plains. I forgot to introduce myself. Um, Emily, I'm Emily Lyson, the vice president. Um, and thank you so much for being here, Caleb. Yeah. Take it away. Thank you. I think there is that I'll share something again. All right. Hello, can you all hear me okay? No, yes? Is there a, is there a, um, where's the mic? Right there. Here. Oh, here. Right this? That's the mic? I think this is camera. Yes, it's the, camera. the camera and the mic. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. If I speak up? Okay. All right. Uh, well, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm Caleb Morris. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some elements of botanical Latin. Uh, but really, I'm going to talk to you about botanical nomenclature. Um, and nomenclature is how we assign scientific names to plants. And those names happen to be in Latin. And I'm going to use the term scientific name sometimes synonymously with taxonomic name. Uh, because taxon is a word that means... Sorry, I'm going to try to... Fix the... So that we had it in the presenter view. Oh. Yeah, just for the people in Zoom. Land. Ah, yeah. uh, part two of it, you know, it, this is what happens in hybrid explanation, <laughs> yada, 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 all that Sorry, stuff. Sorry, Oh, no problem. You, you guys have been here before. We'll be here again. You want to hear a joke? Yes. <laughs> all right. This sounds familiar. <laughs> Three logicians walk into a bar, and the bartender says, will you all be having a drink tonight? And the first logician says, Maybe. And the second logician says, I don't know. And the third logician says, yes. <laughs> it took me a day to figure out. It's about probability. <laughs> All right, we good? Yeah. Did you have notes? In that no, I don't have any notes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> You're going to plug this in. To just Logicians, you know, have to be certain about things. The first logician was going to have a drink herself, but she didn't know if her other two friends were. The second logician was also going to have a drink, but he didn't know if the third logician was going to. But the oh. third logician figured out that the first two were. <laughs> okay. My wife had to actually explain that to me. I think. It's a good joke. Okay, can we go? We're good to go. Okay, good to go. Okay. All right, so... Um, so I, I am a taxonomist, I'm not a Latinist. And a taxonomist is someone who names uh, elements in nature. I happen to work on uh, plants and uh, lichens, but there are taxonomists who name animals, bacteria, uh, algae, all sorts of things. Um, so it's kind of a dry subject. I'm gonna to try to keep it lively. There's some adorable alpacas in the driest desert in the world, uh, the Atacama Desert. No plants. Notice no plants. All right. So uh, I'm going to start. Oh, I should ask: Is there any? Are there any Latinists in the audience? She's a physician. No. Good. No Latinists. Good. Okay. No. No former Latin instructors. No. No. High school. High school. You taught Latin. You took it. Okay. Good. Uh, Ann Shaw is not here. Good, okay. So I don't have to worry too much. Um, so I'm going to give you a two-bit tour of Latin nouns and adjectives, which are really all you got to know for botanical Latin. You don't need to know verbs. Um, I'm going to talk about why scientific names are in Latin uh, and uh, also how you read a name and how you how, why the names change. Uh, which is a, 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 continu a continual bugbear both to uh, amateurs and uh, taxonomists alike, and uh, how you pronounce them, and a little uncultivated plant names, and, uh, and also I'm going to try to convince you to use them. So here's the hard part for me, because I'm not a Latinist, although I did have a lot of Latin uh, 
uh, but it's been 30 years. So um, here's a little two-bit tour of Latin nouns and adjectives. Um, Latin is an inflected language, and that means that the function of a word in the sentence, the subject or the object of the indirect object, is indicated by its ending. The ending of the word tells you what the word is doing in a sentence. Uh, Latin also has gender, so it assigns every noun uh, and adjective uh, either a masculine, feminine, or neuter gender. And they're not masculine and feminine neuter in our sense, but they just give every word uh, this ending, which reflects its gender. Uh, and the gender of an adjective in Latin always agrees with the noun it's describing. So if you say the red balloon, red, if, it's, if balloon is feminine in Latin, which it probably is, red has to be feminine too. And it will end accordingly. It'll terminate accordingly. So both nouns and adjectives can come with one of several sets of endings. And we call those in Latin, we call them declensions. It's the way the word falls out in a sentence. That's what declension comes from, it's falling. And finally, adjectives that modify nouns, they must agree in the gender and the number, that is one or more than one, and the case, what the, what the word is doing in the sentence. But they don't always end the same way, which causes a lot of confusion, because sometimes the uh, sometimes, well, we'll see. So here's some examples of noun adjective combinations. This is the tough part of the talk. The rest of it's going to be cake. <laughs> so, um, so here are two charts that show nouns and adjectives. And, uh, and uh, in the second column, there, there is the case. So nominative is the subject of a sentence. Genitive is a, is a case that describes possession, usually. So my ball would be in, genitive, in the genitive case in Latin. Dative is the indirect object in sentence, to me. Uh, accusative is the object of a sentence, I kick the ball, ball is the accusative case. And ablative is a case that I'm not gonna talk about. <laughs> ablative is a case unto itself in Latin, but it does a lot of cool things, but you don't need to know about it, so I'm not gonna tell you about it. Um, and for every noun, there is a first declension, which is always feminine, they end in A. And the second declension can be masculine or neuter. It ends, M is masculine, neuter is N. And it, if it's a masculine noun in the second declension, in the nominative, it ends in US. <coughs> if it's a neuter noun, it ends in UM. And then the third declension, can I get this off? Yeah, 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 drag it down. Yeah. Yeah. I'll drag it down next go. to Wilbur here. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the third declension, um, Masculine and feminine uh, both take the same ending and neuter takes a different ending. And, and sometimes in the third declension, the nominative starts in an unusual stem word. And then there's this kind of uh, reconfiguration you have to do to put it in any other case. Okay, this sounds super complicated, I know, but it's Latin. <laughs> so, so here are some easy examples. Aqua is the Latin word for Water, yeah. Gelida is an, an adjective that means cold. So aqua is in the first declension and it ends in A. And gelida is also in the first declension adjective and it ends in A. So aqua gelida is feminine, meaning cold water. Uh, if you want to make it plural, you go down to the plural section where the, you say AE in that first column and you match it with an adjective that says A-E in the second column, and it's aquae gelidae, or as we would say in Latin, aquae hit gelidae, something like that. I don't do that. Um, and it's, it's, sometimes it's that easy. So porcus ingeniosus, one smart pig, is porcus ingeniosus, same ending, and that's the nominative. If it were genitive, if it happens to be genitive, it would be porky ingeniosi. It would end in an I, but we're not going to worry about uh, genitive right now. Um, negotium laboriosum is the Latin way to say tedious work, which is Latin. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> it's Latin, but it's not Latin. It's, uh, so negotium is the word for work, and it's a neuter word. And laboriosum is an adjective that ends in US, A, or M, depending on what the word it's modifying is, and the word it modifies is neuter, so it ends in U-M. This all making sense? Clear as a bell, good. All right, so it gets a little tricky when the, when the adjectives end in a different way 
from the uh, from the not the noun they're modifying. So viridis, the word for green in Latin, is a third declension adjective, or first and sorry, a third declension adjective, and it ends in is if it's masculine or feminine. Planta is a first declension noun that ends in a. So green plant is planta viridis. They still are the same in gender. They're both feminine. All right. Sort of like cyclops. Cyclops is a masculine word. And horribilis is a masculine third declension noun. So uh, cyclops is a masculine third declension noun, sorry. And horribilis is a masculine third declension verb. So cyclops has a stem that's cyclops. And if you want to make it into a, if you need to decline it into genitive, you would make it cyclopis, I guess, cyclopidi, something like that. Anyway, so, uh, but, but uh, plural cyclops, cyclops horribilis means terrible cyclops. But if you want to say a bunch of terrible cyclopses, you say cyclopes horribilis, which is down here. I'll just point to it just in case. Cyclopes horribilis. All right, still clear? <laughs> All right, is it getting less clear? All right, um, opus magnum is a great work. Opus looks like a masculine word in the second declension, but it's actually a neuter word in the third declension. And if you wanna make it plural, you have to change it to its, to its stem, which is oper, and the plural of oper in the neuter is opera. Opera, opera! But a great work is an opus magnum, because it's still neuter, and magnus is a second declension adjective. But magna is, a, is the plural, so opera magna, great works. We'll be talking a lot about those today. And finally, just when it was starting to get clear, uh, there's quercus rubra. Quercus looks pretty straightforwardly second declension masculine, but it's actually in the fifth declension, which is not on that chart. There are five declensions, not three. And so Quercus, like all other trees, here's a, here's a good takeaway, all other trees except one that around here are feminine, even though they end in US. So Quercus is modified by the word rubra, which ends in uh, a, like, uh, like a feminine. And a lot of these things, you actually have to look up the word to know how it declines. So you can't, it's not necessarily intuitive. But it is intuitive that all trees are feminine, I guess, except for Acer, which is the genus of maples. That is masculine. No, ma, sorry, it's neuter. But everything else is feminine. So ficus, your ficus is a female. Your hickory, caria, is a female, et cetera, et cetera. All right, how's it going so far? Good. Okay. Now, uh, Scroll down. It's the right arrow. Oh, the yeah. right arrow. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I selected it. There, there we, we go. go. Okay. Now, I'm sorry, this is going to get a little more complicated, then it'll be easy. All right. So, <laughs> just for fun, here are a couple of combinations of nominative noun, genitive, or possessive noun combinations because it's common in botanical Latin to see the genitive. Genitive is how you say my ball in Latin. Actually, it might not be, you might say that in data, but if you want to say vox populi, the, the voice of the people, you say vox in the nominative and populi is in the genitive. So you see that those, both of those words are masculine and uh, uh, vox is a third declension word that starts in a stem, vox, the plural of vox is vocase, V-O-C, so vocal, vox voice. And populus is uh, a second declension noun so it goes to I, vox populi means the voice of the people. Uh, a fool's mandate might be asinine mandatum. Mandatum is a chore and an asinine person is an, as, an, an asinus person in Latin. So you put the I at the end of asini and it's of, of, a chore of a fool. Uh, planta, we've already talked about planta, but a planta is a first declension noun. Uh, nemoris is a, uh, third declension uh, noun, and you can see that the genitive in all those declensions, in first and second declension, sorry, uh, end in O-R-M, O-R-U-M or A-R-U-M. So nemora means a plant of a woodland. Um, 
Piggy's food. I really like slop because we all from Piggy. <laughs> I have a six-year-old. Uh, uh, a dinner of the pig is Sena pork pie. Pork eye in this case is not corpus because it's feminine because Piggy, as we all know, is a girl. And <laughs> Sena is also feminine, but uh, first declension is ends in A-E in the genitive. So Sena pork eye, Piggy slop. And then finally, here's an actual example from botany, Belhaneropsis alnquistiorum, which is a, uh, a genus, Belhaneropsis of lichen, uh, of the Almquist brothers. It is Almquistus is pluralized in that case, so it's Almquistiorum. There are two Almquists. All right, so that's, that's really all you need to know for botanical Latin. Shall we end? <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so, so when you're looking at um, verb, verb noun combinations in Latin, you're gonna see a lot of, a lot of verb, verb words at the end of the, uh, the two word combination, which we'll talk about in a second, that basically just describe a plant. They may describe the inflorescence shape. Um, uh, all of those first line words are in inflorescence shape. So capitatus means head shaped. Corymbosis is a funny shape that's sort of flat on top and kind of vase shaped. Um, they may describe leaf or fruit shape, and all those words are pretty much just shape words. So lanceolatus means lanceolate, lance shaped, arrowhead shaped. Um, ob in front of lanceolatus means backwards. So instead of being this shape, it's this shape. So the, the connection to the, to the stem is in the narrow part versus the broad part. Um, obtuses, pretty, pretty obvious, uh, sort of not very pointed. Acutus means pretty pointed. Um, other, other features of the uh, leaf uh, size stem or uh, size stem or leaf or fruit. Sorry, that's sort of a weird typo. Um, other, other features that describe the, the shape of the plant, like low growing is, is humulus or nana or nanus. Um, stemless is acolus. There's just a bunch of words that describe the shape of the growth form of a plant. Um, Leaves are frequent. Pinnatus. Pinnatus means um, feather like. Pinnatophid means almost feather like. Um, uh, it, uh, descriptors may de describe the smell or the taste. Acer actually just means bitter. So um, maples are described as being bitter. That's the genus of maples, Acer. Um, Amaris means lovely. No, actually it means bitter too. Uh, fetidus might, you might guess, means fetid, which is a stinky smell. So Cucurbita fetatissima is a, a using a superlative adjective, the most fetid gourd, uh, running buffalo gourd. It's astoundingly smelly. It smells like sick people. <laughs> um, uh, and a lot of words describe hairiness. Um, and if you if you have good uh, a good descriptor of hairy, uh, if you know a lot of words that describe hairiness or roughness or stickiness, viscidus means viscid. Uh, glandulosis means glandular. Levis, a uh, common, common word in botany, means smooth. Um, and then a lot of words call it, just describe color, seasonality, or where they're found. Annuous just means annual. Um, and sometimes they describe other features. So um, vomitorious, the last word on the list, <laughs> it is something that induces vomiting. So, um, but uh, one, one, one word I want to just come out, uh, call out on that other uh, helpful features, oides is actually a Greek ending. So there's actually some Greek in bot botanical Latin. And oides is a, a Latinized version of the Greek word that means the sort of the form of, looking like. Um, so with the appearance of, there are a lot of oideses in, in uh, botany, botanical Latin. If you're really super interested in all this stuff, you can find all of these words and more on Wikipedia, good source <laughs> for information. All right, so that's the Latin lesson. I don't know how long this is going on. I, I, I barely started. So the Latin lesson is, as far as scientific names go, you pretty need to, much need to recognize a noun and an adjective, both uh, in the nominative, that is uh, the first, that first line, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes plural, or a noun plus a noun. And the noun, can you, the first noun is always nominative. The second noun is not sometimes nominative, but sometimes genitive, which is, remember that possessive case. And there's Lady Gaga. Uh, I got to get this thing out of the way. Ruining my punchlines. 
So uh, this, is a, this is a genus of fern that was named after Lady Gaga. Uh, and there are a bunch of species. One of them is uh, Gaga turvy monstra, which is uh, her, she calls her followers little monsters. And, um, uh, and there's another one that's just named after her uh, class name, um, Geminata. Her, uh, Gaga Geminata. This is Gaga, This is the type of the genus, uh, and uh, and they named it in part because uh, the sequence, the the gene sequences that define this genus in part are rich in the uh, the uh, the uh, amino acids uh, gu guanosine and adenosine. G A G A. There's lots of repeated G A's in the gene. All right. Were these just recently found? Since they're naming it after a relatively recent human. <laughs> <laughs> She's relatively recent. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get to that in part. Garga marginated is an old old name that used to have a diff, used to be belong in, in a different genus. But there are a bunch of new species that uh, that they discovered in, um, that they named after. I think it's three species of Garga. Okay. So why are scientific names in Latin? Well, basically because of Linnaeus. Linnaeus was a perfecter of scientific nomenclature and he published in Latin as did everyone else at the time. Linnaeus was funny, but also incredibly pompous. And that's what he said of himself. Uh, Deus cryovit, Linnaeus disposuit. God created, Linnaeus ordered. <laughs> All right, but also because principle five of six uh, of the International Code of Nomenclature of Algae, Fungi, and Plants, which governs botanical naming conventions, holds that scientific names of taxonomic groups are treated as Latin regardless of their derivation. There are six principles, but the book is hundreds of pages long. It's a quasi-legal book, uh, a set of rules for naming plants. Uh, also, it governs everything that's sort of related to plants, including uh, algae and cyanobacteria, and uh, a bunch of other things, even some photosynthetic protos, protists. This is the book that we all go to when we want to know how to name a plant. So Linnaeus did something uh, extraordinary. He was pompous, but he was a pretty clever guy. He more or less invented binomial nomenclature. And binomial nomenclature is a system of giving two word names to organisms. And he first published this in his book, Systema Naturae in 1735. And in that book, he covered two volumes, everything that was known to him at the time, which did not include African elephants, interestingly. Uh, so what's in a binomial name? Uh, it's comprised of a genus, which is a noun, this is where we get back to our Latin, and a specific epithet, which is an adjective describing the noun. That's what a binomial name is. Linnaeus's innovation was really to, to coin this two word binomial name and assign every genus uh, and species a trivial name. And he called it a nomen triviale, and it really is trivial. He, he put things into genera. So here's his first page of, um, uh, of his book on plants. And the first genus is canna, which is still canna. We grow it in our yard. And he had three species in the genus canna. And each species starts off with canna because it's in the genus canna. And that's a noun. And then boink, boink, boink. I'll, in the in the right margin, he gave each one a, a, a trivial name. The first one he called Indica, because I think he thought it was from India, even though it's North America, South American. The second one he called Angustifolia, which describes the leaf shape. And the third one he described Glauca. He called Glauca, which describes the color of the leaf. So three different names, which are more or less trivi trivially assigned by him, and those are just sort of mnemonic devices to help you remember each one of those species. That was his, that was his super, super big genius. Before that, every species was named with one of these descriptions. So here's, there's the description. And that's what Linnaeus called a diagnosis. And so it, prior to Linnaeus, if you read a book on, that included canna, every time you saw a canna, it would have this ridiculously long seven word description clarifying which canna it was. And uh, Linnaeus, Linnaeus said, no, the first one, the canna with ovate leaves and acuminate on both the top and the bottom and nerves, I'm gonna call that one canna indica. Okay, that was his big deal. So let's talk a little bit about genus and species, just in case we're all, anyone's unclear. A genus is a group of one to many species. 
So you and I are in the genus Homo and our species is sapiens, Homo sapiens. Linnaeus coined that. Um, and we all descended from a common ancestor. And generally speaking, if there were another species of Homo, and there have been in the past, obviously, uh, we would not be able to interbreed with them. That's a kind of running, working definition of a genus. It's a group of species that are all descended from a common ancestor, but basically are genetically distinct and isolated from this at this point. A species is a population of organisms that are also descended from a common ancestor, but still have the ability to, to make seeds or babies with one another. Um, sometimes they, they, they actually do it. Sometimes they just sort of have the potential to do it. However, so those are our working definitions of genus and species. Uh, we basically assess, for most organisms in the world, we assess whether they belong to a genus or a species by looking at them and looking at their characters, the, their features. Um, so you can't really test every species, every individual of a species to make sure it can make seeds with another individual of the same species. But if they both have, you know, uh, round leaves and yellow flowers, then you might say, well, they look a lot alike, so I bet they're interbreeding. All right. So it's kind of a it's kind of a fudge factor. All right, here is a genus of one, two, three, four, five, six, six species that are all grow around here. Anyone know the genus? Symphiotrichum, yes, or Symphiotrichum, I say. Um, it used to be called aster. Once upon a time, it was an aster, no longer. Anyway, these are all species in, in the genus Symphiotrichum. They also all used to be in the genus aster. Different species, they look the same. Okay, so botanical binomials following the code, scientific names used by plant taxonomists start with the publication of Linnaeus's Species Plantarum in 1753, May 1st. And, uh, and we take all of our generic descriptions, which he didn't provide in his Species Plantarum, weirdly enough, from his Genera Plantarum, which is the, sec the fifth edition that came out the next year. There's my daughter. Oh. One of them. I have two beautiful daughters, but th this is the one who likes botany. <laughs> okay, so um, let's just go back to the code for a second. Here are the principles of the code. One, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help it. Uh, <laughs> names are independent of any names in the zoological uh, or prokaryotic nomenclature. So you can have two animal, an animal and a plant with the exact same name, and often there are. Um, application of the names is determined by the means of types. Talk about that. Accepted name is one with priority over publication. That is the first one to the to the to the end of the race wins. That's the name we use. And um, each tech, but only each text on the group can bear only one name, with a few exceptions. And <laughs> sorry, there, there are five families that have two perfectly acceptable names: uh, legumes, sunflowers, grasses, um, crucifers, and um, mints. But everything else in the, in the whole botanical world has only one accepted name. And finally, the rules are retroactive. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. So a genus name may be drawn from Latin, Greek, or other languages. It doesn't have to be Latin. It can be Greek. It could be a, just a made up word. It could be honoring an individual like uh, Carnegie, named after Andrew Carnegie, saguaro cactuses. Um, could be made up from word combinations, could be made up altogether. This is two, two, of my, two of the species I studied for my master's degree. Tonestus is just an anagram for stenotis. What a lazy botanist. And, um, and, uh, that's, but, but again, the same name can't be used to govern, to, to apply to two different genera under the code. So following the code, the Code of International Botanical Nomenclature, uh, it's okay for there to be a mussel named Natalia, because that's an animal and a yellow flowering plant named Natalia. But unfortunately, there was a, a second plant named Natalia after the yellow one, and that, that one is an illegitimate name. It's actually a holly. Uh, and, um, and finally, uh, there Natalia, Natalia, not Natalia, and then it's okay to make up a word that uses Nuthall's name, Nuthallanthus, which is just a made up name using Nuthall's uh, name, is fine. That's a, that's a toad flax. All right. Nuttall was an interesting guy. Came through this, uh, this area at about 1815. Great botany. Here he is again. Actually, I like Nuttall a lot. Um, so uh, specific epithets, on the other hand. So that's, those are genera. These are specific epithets. They can also be drawn for, from Greek or Latin or some other word, the other language. They can be made up from word combinations. They can honor a place or an individual. 
Uh, they can also be a noun in apposition, which means that you're using a noun to describe another noun, which is kind of weird. And, um, and finally, the specific epithet may be used in combination with different genera. So here are five different genera, all that, that all end in natalii after uh, Thomas Nepal. So calocortis natalii, cornus natalii, weirdly enough, described by John James Audubon. Uh, Alyssum natalii, polygola natalii, and scragulus natalii. As, and the, not, not all was pretty influential. Um, here are a couple other things. So here's a calvatia rubroflava, which is made up of rubrum and flavum, which means red, yellow. So calvatia is a fungus, a puffball that you might find in your garden. It shows up in the fall. Really cool, beautiful. Um, and it was described by a guy who worked at, um, at uh, Washburn in the late 19th century named Francis Cragen. Um, and, uh, and, and our example on the right, a box elder, which is actually a maple, is in the genus Acer, but its specific epithet is Nagundo, which is actually a noun taken from a Sanskrit word. Any Sanskrit readers in the audience? I put it in just in case you want to check my, my work. Uh, so Nagundo is actually a noun. So this is the Acer that looks like Nagundo. Okay, a little more on specific epithets because they're so cool. In botany, specific epithets never duplicate the genus name. There are no cardinalis cardinalises in botany. Um, if honoring a place name, usually the ending of, of the word is ensis or nc, depending on whether it's masculine, neuter, masculine, feminine, or neuter. So flux oklahomensis is the flux that occurs in Oklahoma and Texas and Kansas. It's an endemic, which means it occurs only in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. Um, if honoring an individual, the specific epithet is usually possessive, that is genitive. So uh, the great botanist Alice Eastwood had a Camasonia named after her, and the Camasonia is Camasonia Eastwoodii. <laughs> However, sometimes names honoring people end in I-A-N-A, -A, Iana or Ianus, and because Dolly Parton didn't actually do anything to discover this a uh, rather humble looking lichen, Japuella dolly, dolly partoniana, uh, she gets honored in the Iana way. Still an honor. I don't know if she took it as an honor. <laughs> okay. So binomial, noun, adjective, right? Genus plus species. Uh, except in botany, there's also an author appended to it. So in, for instance, the the name for canna, uh, the one I have in my yard, canna indica, was described as we, we talked about uh, by Linnaeus. So we always put a little L at the end of it. Anytime you see a, a, a hardcore botanical work, it'll say canna indica Linnaeus or canna indica L period. And in fact, there is a whole big book, I brought one for you to see if you want, of all of the standardized abbreviations for plant uh, taxonomists. Uh, mine is C period A period Morse, because I wasn't the first Morse to the game. Um, it's kind of useful, actually, because it's a, little, it's a little bibliographic entry, essentially. You know that anything you see that has an L period was probably described first in Linnaeus' Species Plantarum, and if you want to find the original description, you can go right there. Um, also, because there are so many plants and so many names and uh, actually so few botanical epithets, there is a lot of what we call homom, hom, hom, sorry, homonymy, homonymy, which is where two different things get exactly the same name. And that's a little problem uh, because you've got to figure out which is the one you want, right? It's, it's uh, canna indica Linnaeus, not canna indica C.A. Morse. So actually, all these names that we've seen today are like Acer Nagundo Linnaeus period, Erebus Natalii Kuntz B.L. Robinson period. Blah 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 blah. But also, the genera all have uh, are all described and are credit, credited with uh, with a name. So, for instance, we talked about two Natalias. One was described by D.C., which is De Alphonse de Candolle, and the other one was described by Raffinesque. Raffinesque is the one we use. The other one we call an illegitimate name. Pretty pretty uh, pretty mean. If you ever really want to know anything about this, um, you can you can find all of these names in. Uh, online sources. Italian. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's the best can tell you. All right. How's it going so far? <laughs> I already used up my joke, so I was going to take a little bit. Yeah.
Okay. Oh, sounds up. Okay. Okay. So requirements for publishing a name in the code. If you, if I want to go out and publish a name in the code, following the following the code, I have to do two things. I have to validly publish it, which means I have to have a Latinized name, which we've talked about ad nauseum. That's a Latin expression. <laughs> and it has to be accompanied by an English or a Latin diagnosis or description. It used to be always Latin, but they they kind of um, eased it a little bit. Now English is fine because it's the it's the lingua franca of bot botany. That's Latin too, and uh, and it has to you have to designate a type specimen. So here's a description that I published some, some years ago of a lichen called Felhanera crucitignorum. Crucitignorum is a made up word, but a, a good Latinist that okay, you help me with. Cruci means cross. Tignus means timber. It's a species that I found in the cross timbers of Oklahoma. So we called it <coughs> the Felhanera crucitignorum is genitive of the cross timbers. And a, a friend of mine uh, and I published it. You can see going up there, that's the diagnosis. So if anyone wants to know what this thing looks like, they can read the diagnosis and hopefully it actually accurately represents what that species looks like. There's the type below it. That's the individual specimen that my wife and I collected in 2012. And so that specimen is in our collection at the herbarium. And anytime anybody wants to see it, they can come and look at that specimen. Yes. Not to be extremely ignorant, but how in the world do we know this has never been identified? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. <laughs> can you give me a second? I think I might. Yeah. Uh, the the other thing that you have to do, in addition to publishing it in a certain way with a certain combination of factors, is you have to effectively publish it. Which means I can't just write this down and put it in my drawer and say, well, I published this species. I have to actually get it into a journal uh, and send it out to the world so other people can see it. That's what effective publication is. Um, and there are a lot of things that are, that are sort of marginally effective publications, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and also standards uh, for effective and valid publication used to be really lax. So instead of having to re-describe all the species that were, were, were named up till 1953, they, we cut them a lot of slack, all those botanists who are long dead. We have a comment on chat. I'm just going to share from uh, uh, Amy Klein. He says a portable Latin. Uh, the name of it is a portable, a portable Latin for gardeners by James Armitage. A R M I T A G E uh, is a helpful book organized by color forms, features, and so on. So that can be a helpful additional source. A portable Latin for gardeners by James Armitage. So cool. We're sure. Yeah. All right, so um, so types are important, and this is a type, and actually that, that specimen is sitting on the table back there if you want to see it. Um, type specimens are required because they what they do is they fix the application of a name in botany. If anyone wants to know what a species looks like, the best thing they can do is look at the one specimen that the author of the name, the person who originally described it as a new species to science, said, this is the perfect specimen. This is the one that typifies, exemplifies what that species looks like in almost every way. And that's, that has to be a specimen, an actual thing that someone can pick up and look at. Occasionally it can be a drawing, but mostly it's a specimen. Um, and there are lots of different kinds of types as a consequence, holotypes, isotypes, lectotypes, isolectotypes, neotypes, isoneotypes, even typotypes, that's a joke. And, um, and then also, if you want to uh, create a new genus with a bunch of species and move the species into a genus, you have to designate a type species too, which is just, you pick, the, you pick the species as the author of this new genus that typifies what that genus looks like. Just in case in the future, if someone wants to split up those, those species into your genus into two new genera, they, they, the name goes with the type species. So Echinacea is the type species of the genus Echinacea, I'm sorry, Echinacea purpurea, the purple coneflower that we all grow in our yard, is the type species of Echinacea. And this is a different species that grows in, um, in uh, uh, Missouri and Tennessee. Described by, I should say, described by the namesake of the, uh, sorry, the herbarium that I work at is the namesake of uh, Arl McGregor, uh, whom many of you know, I imagine a long time resident of Lawrence, a uh, great botanist, and, uh, and uh, the world's expert uh, at the time of his death on uh, the genus Echinacea, uh, which is a commercially and um, botanically interesting plant. How's it going so far? I think I'm winding down. I'm not sure. I don't know what time it is. So, so the, the herbarium has at least 15,000 uh, types. Examples. 
Oh, we have about 450,000 specimens. So that was number 15,000. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, we have about, um, we have a huge collection of just cone flowers, um, but in our whole collection, we have about 450,000 specimens of everything. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, Caleb, I'm trying to make it real easy for me. Yeah. The overarching thing is taxonomy, which is like, Taxonomy is a word that means classification yes. of plants and animals. Okay. So within the taxonomy, the first step up is species, not genus. Okay. So it sort of goes back and forth. It's really species. You're right. Okay, so species. Yeah. Okay. And so then the next step up would be genus. Yes. Is that the example you gave the Homo sapiens? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Homo sapiens. And then what goes up from there? Well, that's not really that important. I'll tell you. Well, I mean, there, there, there are an infinite number of um, uh, ranks above genes. And there are actually an infinite, well, there are several ranks below species. But most of the time, botanists talk about genus and species. And a lot, all the rest is sort of frosting on the cake. Um, but if you want to know, I'll give it away. I was, I was going to mention that a little later because I was trying to keep away from that. But, but above genus is family. Oh, sure. And above family is order, and then class, and then phylum. division. We call it division, but yeah, phylum. And then above that is uh, kingdom. So these are all in the kingdom planty. Wow. And, uh, and that just basically includes the green plants, the green algae and their descendants now. Okay. Oh, and we have a, a question. Uh, what's, the, uh, what's the difference between uh, polygonatum and fallopia, why do botanists debate such things? <laughs> uh, That's funny that you're going to ask that, John. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to mention that for a moment, in a moment. Okay. All right. Now, what was the other question that was asked that I was supposed to address? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm still going to get to that. Okay. So why do names change? Uh, so John's question about... Um, Polygonum and fallopia and um, persicaria is actually the common one around here, um, is a problem for botanists as it is for everyone else. So, but the truth is there are a lot of validly published names that meet the definition, the criteria in the code. And more often there's actually one, one more than one species described per species, one more than one name per species. They get described over and over because it's a big world and plants range far and for a long time, um, uh, available works were uh, hard to find. Uh, work, uh, botanical works were hard to find. So principles three and four of the code say that there can only be one accepted name, and that's the first validly published name in, in the literature. So everything starts at May 1st, 1753, and after that, uh, it's a race to get your name first. Um, sometimes we actually discover uh, names that were validly published a long time ago, but were kind of overlooked. So this character, Constantine Samuel, sometimes Schmaltz, uh, Raffinesque, brilliant biologist, um, uh, uh, eccentric, they called him. He published 3,000 different plant genera and about 7,000 different plant names and lost most of the specimens. And his, his descriptions were sometimes based on like second or third hand accounts. So he actually published the name of this whale based on a description he found, he got from in a letter from someone who had like found it on a beach in Sicily. But he published it uh, legitimately and then they got an account for what species of whale this is. No one really knows. Um, he did this a lot though. And, and, uh, and occasionally, he was a pretty perceptive dude. Um, occasionally his names get resurrected. So for instance, um, Isopyrum biternatum is the species I grew up uh, uh, knowing uh, false ruinemony. Uh, is now a Nemeon biternatum, which is a Raffinesque name. Um, so sometimes names just turn up and you have to accept them because, because what the code tells you, the first one gets published wins. Uh, but more often than that, here's your answer, uh, careful study of all the type specimens and descriptions in the world turn up a whole lot of things that describe the same species over and over. So here's a, a lowly um, micaria, which is a, a lichen. And you can see those are millimeter markings. So it's pretty small, um, hard to see. All the characters are kind of inside those little black domes, which are the, the fruiting bodies. But uh, Micaria denigrata, 
which was first named by um, Magnus Fries, um, actually has been described 20 different times under different names. And so uh, when, the, when, a, when um, this careful Scottish worker named um, Brian Coppins went through and looked at all these specimens and read all the descriptions and pondered and pondered and pondered, he said, there's one name for this thing, it's Micaria denigrata, and this is all the different ways it's been named. So all those names we call synonyms. They're like the, they're, they're identical uh, species that have a name that is not long, no longer recognized. We all call, we call this all Micaria denigrata now, not any of those other names. Does that, that answer your question? Basically, you just have to guess. <laughs> Lots of yeah. How do you go? I think this one hasn't been identified before. Yeah. Is it just because you're so over focusing now? Yeah. So, uh, so there's there's basically two ways. One, you you get to know your local flora, flora, and um, and you you know all of the species really well. And when you see something new, you say that's new. And um, and the other is it, there's a lot of scholarly work that goes into it basically tracking down all the descriptions of other things that have ever been named that might be yours and kind of ferreting out which one seems to be close. And then you, you borrow a type and you look at the type and you say, is this thing the same as this thing? That's all there is to it. It's just a lot of uh, library work, yeah. So in your personal experience, did you find that in the field or was it something you were already looking at more in Scenario? Like, how did you come upon that? Uh, so I, I am a field biologist and I just go out and collect things in the field and uh, bring them back and try to figure out what they are. And that's hard with uh, lichens. Um, that particular thing that I described, I thought for a long time was another species that grows in uh, like Canada on trees because it looks a lot like it. And then one day I found um, fruiting bodies which showed spores and the spores were totally different. Um, so I collected a whole lot of it thinking it was one thing. And then one day I found some fertile stuff and I said, wait, that, that can't work out. And then I, I, I figured out what genus it most likely belonged to based on the characters I could see. And I went to the literature on that genus and found that it was unlike any other member of that genus. So it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of both. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's great. I'm glad you're asking questions. Very like organic things that don't last forever. How do you hold on to that long enough to determine, or do you just know your source? You all have to like find it again. Oh well, look behind you uh, on the table. You'll see some specimens that are prepared um, that are all type specimens, and um, they don't they they don't last if you don't prepare them in the right way. Mm -hmm. In botany, we dry everything in a plant press, or we just if they're lichens, we just dry them. Um, and and once they're dry, they're per pretty stable. So we have, we have botanical specimens that are still usefully sci useful scientific specimens that go back into like the 1500s. Um, as, as long as they're kept free of pests, they stay pretty, pretty cool, pretty good. Sorry, cool is not the right word. <laughs> if you keep them cool, that's better too. Um, okay. So here's a little nomenclatural priority in action. I like this because it's kind of a dirty word. So this is a uh, double coconut. You can see one back on the table because they're just amazing. World's largest seed, uh, grows only in the Seychelles in the Red Sea. And, uh, and it used to be super coveted by European royalty and rich people. And uh, they would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for these things and kind of bling them out with jewels. Um, but it, it was named Cocos Maldivica in 1791 by a botanist. Um, and that name kind of fell into obscurity. And another botanist named Jean, I'm sorry about this, Jean-Henri Jean saint um, published a new description of it, uh, the Coco de Mer, under Lodoisia, the genus, Lodoisia, and he called it Cali Piggy, which means nice bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Cali is a, a Cali Piggy. There's a Venus Cali Piggy, you know. The, anyway, um, it's, a, it, it's unfortunate because it was, a, it was a younger synonym of Lodoisia Maldivica. So we don't get to use calipiggy, but it's a, it's a exactly priority in, in action. Working for you. Okay, so that's two reasons why things names change, but mostly it's really because our knowledge is increasing. Names are changing because we're learning more about the natural world. And um, our system of classification is designed to reflect evolutionary relationships among organisms. Linnaeus actually didn't have that idea. He just kind of ordered things by the number of uh, stamens and, uh, and pistols everything had. 
but we actually try to group plants and animals by their, their common uh, descent. And so we're learning more about common descent. There, of course, is the origin of species, Darwin's seminal work on uh, common descent, natural selection. And, uh, and since the, at least the 18, 1850s, we've been increasingly ordering things by, um, by, uh, uh, by evolutionary descent. So today, especially, we're using a lot of DNA to, to work out these problems. And, um, and we're recognizing, one, that there's just a huge amount of undescribed biodiversity. Everything, there's a whole lot of species, um, even genera, that haven't been named. So for instance, this uh, cute little shelfy fungus, which is actually a lichen, uh, was studied some years ago. And the guys who, who found it, um, uh, who, who were looking at it, were looking at its DNA, and they, they found at least 126 different species under one name. And by their sampling method, which is depicted on this map of South America, uh, they estimate it's probably more like 400 different species, all called Dictinium glabratum. And theoretically, every one of those species should have its own binomial under Dictinium. So there should be a whole lot more adjectives. Yeah. So each species has its totally different DNA sequence, or yeah. is there an order to the DNA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very good, yeah. So the, the, the question is how different are individuals? And usually, you know, if you get like more than like a 10% difference, they start pulling out new species. It, it de depends on the species. It depends also on the DNA. Some DNA uh, mutates very rapidly. Uh, other DNA mutates almost not, not at all. So there's actually one kind of sequence that people call the DNA barcode of life, which is the internal transcribed spacer. Um, which is used extensively in botany and, and, and mycology to distinguish different species. And people will often, it is not my preference, but people will often actually describe new species based entirely on the differences that they find in the DNA, even if they can't see any differences in the organism, which I think is a terrible idea. I would never do that. Yeah. Just looking at new species, are they being discovered as never seen before or have they developed any? What are the steps to decide something has changed and I'm going to read May? Like maize is nothing like hot butter sweet corn. <laughs> you know, yeah. How, what, how many steps does something have to go through before it becomes a new identity? Yeah. So, so really, it depends on it depends on the organism you're talking about, and um, and we uh, uh, taxonomists tend to try to tend to be um, pretty conservative in, in what they call a new species based on like genetic differences. Um, most of the time, people will look at, um, at, at uh, groups of plants. This is what I know. I know plants and fungi. They look at them and they, they try to get an idea of how much variability, um, variability in like characters there are. So whether uh, a, a flower is always yellow or sometimes blue. That's a trivial example, but, um, but that kind of variability. It's really morphological variability. You can see with your eyes or under a microscope. And they try to get an idea of how those characters vary within each individual organism, but also within the whole group. And those are the characters they use to, to say, this is a species, this is another species, this is a genus, this is a family. Um, it's kind of by guess and by gosh. I, I mean, People like people like DNA a lot because it seems to be really, really objective, as opposed to by guess and by gosh. It seems to be if you got a branch, you get this branch here. Well, that's certainly different, right? That's a big branch. This is a common ancestor. Right? This is a, a putative common ancestor that's shared by all of these individuals. But that branch looks pretty big and probably it's two different groups. I don't know. I mean, that's the way it works. And, and it, it, is, it is a little tricky and you have to kind of know your organism uh, and you also have to know what, what you're doing like with the data. Like you got to know what DNA you're looking at. What, what, is that DNA that's actually informative? Uh, probably, they're smart. And this information would be used if you were like going to become a scholar Yes. Like I'm not going to use this when I go to pond. No, 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 <laughs> no. Good segue. Can I cut you off for a second? Because this is this is how it comes comes to us. 
So we also find you know, with all this sequencing, we're also finding that a lot of um, genera that we used to sort of describe broadly with a lot of different species really should be treated as smaller individual genera with fewer species. So here's one more tree, which you don't ever have to look at again, I promise. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's in the, this is the not meat family. And here's one, two, three, four, five, five, five sorry, seven, 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 spe seven genera of knotweeds. We used to call all of these uh, uh, four genera, but it turns out that, um, that these guys and these guys, which we have long time grouped together, are not actually that closely related to one another. And we used to call all of that polygonum with a, and the, the other little genera that are poking in there, Bistorta, Aconagonon, Canigia, those have always been recognized because they're super distinct, but it turns out that they kind of make, it, make our classification system, uh, they kind of screw up our classification because they kind of pop up in the middle of polygonum. So what we've done as a consequence, just so, is we split up polygonum into three different genera. And so it comes to you if you grow Kiss Me Over the Garden Gate, which I think is a stunning plant. Anyone know Kiss Me Over the Garden Gate? Um, so, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that um, the truth is that um, most plants and animals don't um, uh, evolve as rapidly as viruses do. Um, in in large part because of just like lifespan, you know, um, and I think. For things like climate change, they they mostly they just cause things to go extinct <laughs> because they don't because because in truth those animals and plants can't adapt fast enough. The, the, I mean, climate change is a, 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 has had a dramatic effect in the last twenty years, but most of the plant species we know are millions of years old. Um, there are a couple of examples of sort of rapid evolution in plants, but. By and large, they're just really like everything else. They're just really slow evolve, to evolve, and um, you know, uh, I think uh, natural selection is kind of a different topic. But um, but there, are, there, are, there are, and it's something I don't actually know anything about. So um, yes. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, definitely some some plants are going to be big winners, right? <laughs> I mean, it, apparently also uh, poison ivy grows faster under you know elevated temperatures, so you know get used to it, I guess. Anyway, so uh, so the 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 the. Uh, the takeaway from this is that sometimes we actually split up genera because we want our classification system to reflect evolutionary relationships and to maintain something like polygonum, where it actually includes several distinct elements that are separated by other distinct elements, uh, doesn't make logical sense, hence my logician joke. And we're trying to make logical classifications that affect, that, that reflect evolutionary relationships. And so now instead of polygonum orientale, we have Persicaria orientalis and wild buckwheat, which we've all weeded out of our gardens, is now polygonum convolvulus, uh, fallopia convolvulus rather than polygonum convolvulus. And we still have some, some polygonums, but no one ever sees them. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they like uh, cyborg cracks. Does that help, John? All right, is that, is that kind of clear? Clear as mud? As good as the Latin explanation? So just one more thing. What does the name change? Actually, not I have a few more things. Uh, what does the name change look like? Um, well, in in the the code requires that uh, the names stay pretty similar, pretty pretty constant. And so we have something called a basionym, which is the first specific epithet that gets si assigned to uh, a species. And so in the case of per Persicaria orientalis, the first basionym was orientale, 
which Linnaeus actually assigned to polygonum orientale. And so that orientale little bit of the name always moves with, with uh, the species, no matter what genus the species is in. So Persicaria orientalis is uh, based on the type that Linnaeus identified as oriental polygonum orientale. And the person who made that combination was named Ludwig Spach. So he gets named for the combination, he gets credit for the combination in Persicaria, Persicaria orientalis, but Linnaeus actually gets credit for the Bazianin orientale. So that's why, that's why names often have um, uh, this little parenthetical object. It tells, you, it tells you where that first appearance of orientale is. It's a great bibliographic um, treat. Um, Tool. And this is one thing that makes botanical nomenclature so much better than zoological nomenclature. They don't do that in zoology. It's just the first person who names it. They never, they never credit the person who makes the combination or the person who, I think they, they credit the person who makes the combination, but not the other person. So I don't, I'm, I'm biased. Okay, so here's what everyone really wants to know. How do you pronounce these damn things? <laughs> okay, so all syllables are voiced. Emphasis falls on the penultimate or the anti-penultimate syllable. That is the second to the last syllable, the penultimate, or the anti-penultimate, the second to the second last syllable. So I say medicago, which is medic, um, that little, uh, uh, well, uh, alfalfa. Medicago, medicago. And I also say symphiotricum, which is asters, but some people say symphiotricum. I don't know. Either the antipenult or the penult. C's can be hard or soft. Canna, circium. Acer, echinacea. I don't know. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason. Just say it loud. Um, y is variable. I usually pronounce a Y as a Y. Sinancum, but sometimes it's cisarynchium. You know, I, I or Y or I. Terminal E's are always pronounced. Don't ever ignore the terminal E. They're not silent E's. Always pronounce that terminally, otherwise you sound like an ecologist. <laughs> Sorry. So Alcini, not Alcine, Alcini. Illinois NC, not Illinois If you do that, you will sound like a taxonomist, Illinois NC. Terminal I's are always pronounced I, and sometimes when they're doubled, it's EI. So McGregory I is this uh, this species of uh, wild rye is Elemis with a short I, short Y, Metgregorii, not Metgregorii or Metgregorii. All right. And as a penultimate, as a penultimate uh, more syllable, you say I as I or E, depending. Syriaca is how I say the uh, sp a specific epithet for um, common milkweed, Asclepius syriaca. But you could say Syriaca if you wanted to. I don't know. Anyway. My last, my, my takeaway is always just say it loud. If you say it loud, then people will follow. I mean, it worked for Trump, right? I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So here's, here's a little bit about your question about, um, about um, taxonomic hierarchy. So we, we, we actually also sometimes recognize taxonomic groups below the level of species. So there are taxonomic designations for subspecies and varieties and forms. And those are all named in the same way as species, with a with an author and a and a, they just have a specific epithet or a varietal epithet. So variety um, albus is a is a is a name, and that would describe a species with a binomial. So that's actually a tri, a true trinomial. Um, and only if there if the variety name is different from the species name does it actually have an author, because we think of every time you name a species, there are an infinite number of categories that can both be belong to below um, the species. So if I say um, polygola alba, there's also in, implied by that variety alba, forma alba, subforma alba, and all those things kind of go with polygola alba. But if I describe a new variety, polygola alba variety flava, the yellow flowered white polygola, then that flava gets a new, a new author uh, appendage. Um, but also because taxonomic classifications are hierarchical, um, Every species is placed into successively higher groups. And here are the most common ones, kingdom, division, class, order, family, genus, species, and then below it, subspecies, variety, and form. So believe it or not, if you're a botanist and you're worried about what family something belongs to, um, you'll, uh, 
you'll pay attention to this. And, and um, family is the most common thing we say, see, and um, family names are all A-C-E-A-E, -E, which is a Greek word, a Greek ending, and you say A-C-E. -E. So the family of uh, sunflowers is the aster A-C-E, -E, and the mints are the fade, uh, sorry, the uh, labi, lamy A-C-E, -E, and, uh, and so, so on and so forth. All right, I, I really only have one more slide. I'm sorry this is taking so long, but this has been fun for me. I appreciate you guys. <laughs> uh, I don't know anything about cultivated plants. I am a taxonomist of, uh, of non-cultivated plants, but cultivated plants also have a set of rules and they are governed by the International Code of Nomenclature for Cultivated Plants. Um, and you can buy a copy if you want, I can't afford it. Um, <laughs> they follow a, a common name or a Latin name. So they actually, take up um, Latin uh, uh, plant taxon taxonomic names, and then they, they uh, affix a, uh, a common um, a cultivated name to it. So um, cultivated names may actually be groups. Um, and so um, uh, all of our hostas belong to the Hosta Fortunii group. And if you're, if you're writing the, um, the cult cultivated name formally as a group, you capitalize Fortunii. And even though it's Latin, uh, you do not italicize it. And then you capitalize group too. So it actually has to be hosta, italicized, that's the Latin name for the genus, Fortunii, group, capitalized, not italicized. That's the rules. Um, uh, and if you're, if you're an orchid breeder, you know about grexes or greggies. Grex is uh, the Latin word for, uh, for group, or gregarious. We get the word gregarious from it. And uh, a grex is usually a sort of a hybrid swarm in which someone's taken a bunch of different species or genera and made new uh, cultivars out of them. So this is a uh, Angulocassi grex, Sandy Murphy, is, uh, is a, a nothogenus, that is uh, a new uh, hybrid uh, developed from crossing two different genera of orchids, uh, Angulo, Angulo and Lycasti. And the person who coined this name, um, put them together as angulocasti, and they indicate that it's a of a hybrid origin by putting that little multiplication sign in front of it. So one might read it as X angulocasti, um, and that's, that's a grex. And then finally, um, a cultivar, which we used to call a uh, cultivar name, uh, is non-Latin and is put in single quotes. So anytime you see a cultivar name, like the common uh, potato, so Solanum tuberosum desiree, it's uh, ca capitalized and, and in single quotes. So why would you want to learn all this stuff? Um, scientific names are actually pretty stable, despite the, the, the complaining about um, splitting up genera. Um, and they facilitate accurate communication about species. That's why I use them. Um, they also, because we are interested in um, naming things based on their evolutionary relationships, they, they tend to communicate more information about all sorts of other biological phenomena in nature that you might want to predict from a name. So appearance, phenology, phenology is when something flowers, um, the ecological function it plays in, in, in a community, a plant community, uh, the chemistry of the plant, which is sometimes important for people who are interested in medicinal chemistry, um, and other aspects of bi biology, for instance, how susceptible a particular species is to an herbicide. I seriously thought this was like the gateway drug. Because <laughs> first I'm lured into this class and it's oh nice rose and then I thought oh my god now I'm in here and this is how we're gonna talk. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is so fantastic. Thank you. Oh yeah yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I, you for I, saying. I, that. I, like, I thought you were gonna oh, say oh this is the worst talk ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I certainly attempted to learn a lot. I might have a whole new level of stupid, but uh, <laughs> I just I was so worried that this is how. I'm going to leave this room and now everybody's going to be going, okay, so Cariopsis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, good. Uh, anyway, sometimes knowing the taxonomic name will help you make good garden choices. So here's one I want to leave you with. Uh, here are two bittersweets that are widely planted in North America. One is a terrible invasive that's showing up in, in Kansas now, probably too late for us. But that is this species, which is Celastris orbiculatus. And the other one is our native uh, Celastris scandens. Two members of the genus Celastris. One's bad, one's good. And you read the label on the, at the nursery and you, and you say, it, 
uh, Celastris urbiculatus, and you say, ah, I'm not going to put that in my yard because it's going to strangle all of my trees. And finally, sometimes they're funny. <laughs> so this is a recently described begonia, which is widely available in the nursery right now. And the, uh, the, uh, all right, any other questions? Yeah. How many uh, species have you named? How many species have I named? Uh, something like 20. Not, not that many. Many There are many um, people who've named lots more species. Mostly lichens? Uh, all of my species have been lichens or things related to lichens. Um, lichens are often studied along with a group of fungi that are not themselves lichens, but but sort of look like them and behave like them. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like them like them. Yeah. So how does that come back around to you? Like, is it similar to a patent in somebody's, like, is it just a matter of- That's a great question. Keeping on it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, there, so taxonomists in, in my, I mean, people in horticultural trade, are you know developing new hybrids or cultivars to to sell? That's not what we do. We we do, we are just interested. It's purely academic exercise in trying to uh, understand the world and elucidate all of the different animals and plants and fungi in it. And so we give uh, uh, people who describe a new species, name a new species, um, credit for for the naming in, in large part, so you can track down their their name. You can track down their name in the literature, um, but it's all done gratis. Uh, and uh, and I have no uh, uh, the few species I've named. I have no no royalties. No royalties. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's just all um, you know. It's all because we're interested, and in, you know, there's some ego in it, obviously. Uh, some people name stuff all the time, um, and. Uh, so. The whale guy, yeah. yeah. I have a quick question. Uh, something that I've gotten more interested in recent years is the classification of tribe between family and genus. And I know I find them very helpful when that very helpful for when trying to identify something in the field. For for reference, if any of y'all ever look at can the new cans about wildflowers and weeds from 2015, which is fantastic, I definitely recommend it. Um, a lot of our species are going to be in uh, Asteraceae, right? A huge amount. I mean, it's a huge section of the book, and so you need you have to. It can be very helpful to actually go by tribe underneath that. Yeah. But I, I've always uh, been curious about like how, like yeah, like uh, like what goes on in, in terms of that kind of area. <laughs> it's uh, it depends, and and that's a good question. So um, so the, the family you're mentioning is the sunflower family, and there are a few families that are just gigantic worldwide. So there are probably twenty thousand species in the sunflower family, which includes sunflowers, not, not surprisingly, but also asters, less surprisingly, maybe, or more surprisingly. Um, and then other things like goldenrods um, uh, uh, and ragweeds. So ragweed is a member of the sunflower family. Uh, dandelions, uh, lettuce, uh, chicory, a ton of stuff, all sorts of stuff. And, um, and so some, some families, there's a lot of interest in, um, because there's so many members of the, the sunflower family, is some interest in sort of sorting out the things between the, the taxonomic ranks between family and genus, just so you can kind of make some sense of it. That, that tribe would go in here and it would be pronounced oide, if you care. Um, but it really depends on the, on the, on the family. Um, the same as might be said for orchids, of which there are also 20,000 species, or lagoons, of which there are also 20,000 species. Um, but 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 small families, there are not. Um, there's not so much interest in sorting out um, things below families. <coughs> Anyone else? Yeah. How come there are so? And then maybe it's just the plants that we do, but there's a lot of plants left. Canadensis, you know, and there's a lot of plants left that are genetic that are Virginia. Yeah. How come we don't have a lot of plants with other states or other uh, Kansas? Yeah. That's a great question. Well, there are a lot. There are a lot of plants with Canadensis and Virginicus and Carolinianus, because those plants were all named by um, uh, European, Northern European botanists. And anytime they got in the like the 16th, 1700s, uh, Linnaeus mostly, 
And anytime they got something from North America, they thought, oh, it's got to be from Virginia because it, it was, uh, or Carolina or Canada. So that's why there are so many Canadenses and in Virginicas. And, um, and, and you have a lot to do with Thomas Jefferson and Akeem Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of it, I think it goes back to that, doesn't it? A lot of it. was kind of the father of That's, America. yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so Linnaeus was kind of, what, uh, 1753, and then about uh, 50 years later, uh, there's this huge flowering of North American botany that started with the Lewis, Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, but prior, prior, to, prior to the Lewis and Clark expedition, 1804, I think, um, there were a bunch of people who were sending material back from the colonies, and these ended up in the in the herbaria in in Europe, and they just got these. You know, they they didn't know what to call them, so they just called them Canadenses. I mean, it was just Canada at the time, right? Um, uh, I was going to say something else. Oh, oh, and but some names are just seem to be doomed, and one of the names, one of the specific epithets that seems to be really, really unlucky is Kansensis. Don't ever name anything Kansensis. It always turns out to be something else that was that was named before. <laughs> there's a there's a Cicerin, there's a blue-eyed grass called Cicerinchium kansensi, which is Cicerinchium campestri now. Um, I think uh, Ron McGregor actually named something Kansensis. No, he wrote he wrote about it. But but there's a whole bunch of Kansensis. Actually, I have a I have a mushroom back there named Pol uh, uh, Poliparis kansensis, and it's now Poliparis radicatus. So just I don't know. We came too late to the game. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Um, and yes, Cindy. Yeah, I think, uh, Megan, do you want to do your presentation now? We can. I just, I'll need a couple people to help me bring some boxes in. Okay, they're going to give awards to our classes that were not uh, acknowledged, and then we're going to receive a I think I'm good. I really appreciate you coming. Are you going to be able to stick around for some of the So, yeah. Okay, cool. Also, uh, I got a message from my dad. He sends his 